So let's just give it like maybe two minutes or something, let a few other folks filter in. That's all right. <laughs> I guess while the folks are filtering in, I'll introduce myself. So I'm uh, Robert Esker. I'm the product manager for OpenStack at NetApp. And um, <clears throat> been working with OpenStack for three and a half years. I think, I think if my uh, basic arithmetic skills are, are, are working, I think this is the seventh design seminar I've attended. So it's really interesting to see the progression and the, the growth in the, in the, uh, the whole of the event. Um, thanks for, for the folks in the audience for showing up. Day three after uh, two successive nights of, uh, of late night parties. Uh, I hope everyone here took their uh, Advil from the Piston Party uh, the night before last. <laughs> um, I guess we'll just go ahead and get started. So the intent of this session is just to talk about what up NetApp's been up to in OpenStack for, like I said, the last several releases. Uh, you know, I said I've been involved for the last seven design summits, our stuff's debuted in Essex. Uh, where we're at, and just a little bit about where we're intending to go. Uh, I want to demonstrate or deliver kind of an overview of what it is we have done, why we think that's of use, and get into a little bit about where we're, uh, we're going in the next uh, six months development time slice, namely for, for Juno. Uh, this is uh, intended to be, you know, in the mic, uh, interactive, so uh, we can, uh, mindful of time, I, I'd like to get through all of this, so um, we may pen some of the questions to the end, but if there's something that's terribly pressing, please do, do stop me along the way. Uh, we've also got a number of other folks in the audience from NAP, so if I can't answer a question, I'm, I'm sure we can uh, find a way to, to get at what you're wanting to know. So again, thanks for attending. Um, just to start with, I just want to paint a little bit of a picture of where we see uh, NetApp's product portfolio and the cloud going forward, and where we see OpenStack in particular fitting amidst all of that. Um, so it's definitely the case that um, we have a number of different capabilities within our portfolio. Uh, and, and, you know, but if you look at it from a different angle, we've got some interesting intellectual property within our portfolio. The ability to move data in a lightweight way that's opaque to the application layers above it, uh, thin manner, that type of thing. Uh, we also start with being, at least in the form of our data on tap product, uh, where we are deploying the single most utilized storage operating system in the world. Now, you know, you're probably familiar, NAP's not the single largest storage company in the world, but when you look at the fact that for many years the, all of our innovation was delivered in the form of data on tap, um, it was, it's an excellent place to start in essentially building a common data fabric across endpoints, whether that be hyperscale clouds. So today you can actually land on tap systems in, in colos that are like low latency connections resident, you know, for example, to EC2, so that's called net private storage for AWS. But in the future, you'll also see, you'll see, not distant future, you'll see ONTAP resident as an instance in public clouds and, and a variety of other kind of more, you know, hyperscale public clouds, but also in a variety of other places as well. And of course, we see increasingly OpenStack as that common infrastructure as a service runtime. You'll certainly see large scale clouds uh, built. Um, you know, I, I know there's some of the folks here this week talking about, for example, Rackspace and HP Cloud and IBM's got ambitions. There are a variety of CloudWatt in Europe that are building large scale public clouds that avail OpenStack interfaces. And so not only in the sense that it be, has the potential to become ubiquitous, uh, you know, as a standardized, abstract standardized interface to these infrastructure primitives, but also because it does shim in support for some of the hyperscale providers, certainly AWS today, but increasingly, we expect, uh, you know, I noticed there was a, start, a project that was started up in this uh, last, in the Ice House time frame that had some primitive support, for example, Google Compute Platform. Uh, I, I wouldn't be terribly surprised if Azure showed up. I think I saw something in the news that indicated that while they may not actually, you know, build on OpenStack, they probably will start availing OpenStack interfaces. So we see this as that kind of common infrastructure as a service uh, runtime, for lack of a better term. You know, private clouds you know, that want to actually be established in relation to various hyperscale and other clouds, uh, increasingly we believe will default to OpenStack. And if not OpenStack, built on some technology that supports those set of APIs so that you can have this common data, a common plane that just sits atop what we're trying to build, this common data fabric. 
so that's that's a big part of it. Now, you know, of course, OpenStack is is a, obviously a you know, thriving open source community by some measures, the fastest growing in history. We've been at this for a little while. Uh, that operating system I just mentioned is uh, originally built of BSD origins. We we push and pull frequently. We're the employers of some of the primary maintainers of NFS and Linux, for example. So it was very organic for us to, to end up in OpenStack as early as we did. And to that point, we in fact were um, the first major storage vendor to have joined and also to have submitted integrations upstream. Uh, I mentioned that I've been involved in the last seven design summits. There's been a progression in delivery of integrations, which we'll get into more depth here shortly. Uh, we've been at it for a number of releases and having matured and expanded upon our offerings. And I should also offer that we're in the midst of a hyper growth phase at, at NetApp as it applies to OpenStack. So I would probably be remiss if I didn't put in a plug for have a look at our job postings. <laughs> Um, there's a number of things we do really well. And so no intention to go through all of what those things are. You know, whether it's our E-Series platform or our FAS platform, they're the things that differentiate from commodity storage in the market. And so when you take a look at something like a Cinder, a standardized block storage abstraction, we as a company, NetApp, cannot, cannot afford to have, you know, have those competencies hidden behind that abstraction. At the same time, you know, customers loud and clear want the value of that sort of open and standard abstraction. So I, I want to write my application logic against this Cinder API and I can switch an implementation per use case what makes the most sense. Support a certain SLA, you know, support a certain cost metric, whatever it is. And so uh, we've got a number of things that we bring to the table, but settle upon that abstraction, but still get at the richness of our set of capabilities. So that's where we start when it comes to engaging in the community, is making sure that, in, in terms of development, is making sure that nothing's left behind. So whether it's various qualities of you know, data protection or storage efficiency, performance assurance, encryption, so on and so forth, those things must be availed explicitly and accessible to a tenant. I'll talk about how in just a moment. So you know, we start with Clustered on Tap. I talked about how it can actually um, uh, be resident in a number of different contexts. This is a little bit abstract, but that operating system can sit in front of NetApp disk, can sit in front of uh, various forms of foreign disk, you know, other, other companies' arrays. It can also actually increasingly sit atop what we, you might argue with this definition, increasingly refer to as disk as a service, aka EBS. So you can imagine a scenario in which we take uh, those capabilities and deliver the richness of ONTAP on top of it. Uh, you know, I, I arguably a legacy of, of NetApp, um, at least in the ONTAP space, not so much in the E-Series area, is, you know, we've taken commodity components and knit them together, provided software capabilities on top of it to, you know, to support enterprise type requirements, you know, high availability service provider and cloud requirements as well in the last several years. So what's kind of depicted here is uh, the, the, what's referred to as a storage virtual machine. So in Clustered on Tap, and actually let me get into a little bit more here, you have this notion of a virtualized storage controller, virtualized network interfaces called lifts, and the virtualized disk uh, container, the, uh, the flex ball, if you will. And the, these things can be moved across, this is intended to connote like a physical separation, those little vertical lines, wherein that's the hardware, but we don't care because we can move these across a cluster. This cluster can grow horizontally, you can scale horizontally, you can scale vertically, because we can swap in individual heads you know, for a given workload that doesn't lend itself to being distributed across multiple systems. So you have the you know, multiple axes by which you can actually scale. Um, you know, no intent to go through the entire bullet list, but again, we're bringing that sort of richness of set of capabilities. One of the imports of this is that we can support continuous availability, continuous uptime, something we think is particularly uh, valuable when you have a vastly you know, commingled multi-tenant cloud uh, that is deployed uh, with OpenStack. So your underpinning storage, in our sense, you know, is is you you, you need not necessarily take any downtime to expand, contract, frankly, move if you can span the cluster interconnect across locales, that type of thing. It's, like I said, it's a good place to start to being the most you know prevalent and most widely deployed single you know, commercial storage operating system in the market. So the places where we start, 
uh, are certainly in block storage. We've done some work around image and object storage. Object storage. I'll get into that in just a second. And this is just sort of uh, an overview. And I'll go through a highly simplified, frankly somewhat trivialized view of uh, common OpenStack services and where they map to NetApp product portfolio. Um, is there a question or should we pin it to the end? Or just, you're just discussing amongst yourself. Okay. Um, so the first thing is uh, glance. Well, what, it, what does it mean? So uh, I guess the first thing, we'll just talk about it on data on tap. Certainly you saw that it, it can be applied in a variety of different ways to our product portfolio. So there's a, two primary options with glance. Back end it with an object store, Swift, or with a file back end. And very commonly, and in fact, I think probably most logically, that's something like an NFS, wherein you can apply something like NetApp's deduplication capabilities to aggressively compress the amount of capacity associated with your image repository. You know, so we, we, have, we play tricks with pointers, and you know, we, uh, we basically fingerprint data in, uh, in, uh, in certain uh, 4K boundary is what it actually amounts to, and we identify commonality and uh, you know, basically uh, you know, re remove the unnecessary duplication. So you know, of course we make that single copy that's shared uh, immutable uh, such until it, you know, it's all, all references to it are decremented. But the point is, is that with images, you know, imagine a scenario where you've got like 12 different uh, varieties of, of RHEL you know, 7 you know, with different stacks on top of it in your, in your images. Well, because there's so much commonality of the bits within it, you know, maybe the number is more like you know, 500, uh, you get pretty dramatic deduplication rates. And I'll talk a little bit in a minute about why this is even more important when, it talks, when, we, when we get to uh, creating instances more rapidly. So uh, you know, again, the image service uh, can also, of course, de be deployed. Uh, we can you know, take our E-series systems. EF, by the way, are an all-flash variety of E-series systems. And uh, you know, take the, the glance bits and actually sit it atop there as well. Uh, some of the duplication benefits you just described do not apply in that scenario. We have a future platform uh, we've already announced that is a kind of from the ground up native all-flash array, probably more specifically aligned to uh, you know, kind of those crown jewel, classic, somewhat more siloed applications, at least initially. But uh, to the extent possible, we're going to aim for zero-day currency on, flat, you know, for sender support with FlashRay. Uh, storage Grid is a, uh, uh, you know, a software uh, object storage capability that was hardened over time in the, uh, uh, in you know, very terse regulatory uh, uh, type, uh, uh, you know, a regulatory sort of. Um, enforced uh, environments, healthcare, for example. And so we're taking a lot of like that sort of hardened set of capabilities and delivering it in the form of, that you might expect that's more a little, a little bit more organic uh, to like OpenStack use cases, support the type of API endpoints that you would expect on it. Uh, and that'll be more, more to say on that later in the year. But you can certainly imagine where uh, in the case of image, <clears throat> Um, in the case of like the image repository where object is the back end, that would be applicable. There's also a, 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 a really interesting way to actually take this Swift reference implementation in the here and now and deploy it on our E-series systems. I'll get into more depth on that in just a moment, but there's some particularly uh, unique qualities, kind of a node level erasure coding within the, within the E-series system that allow us to use more of a traditional parity scheme to dramatically reduce the number of copies associated with a typical Swift deployment. So more on that in just a moment. Actually, right now. <laughs> so, you know, so those, you may be familiar if, you're, if you know much about Swift that, um, uh, you know, placement for protection is, is handled via a consistent hashing ring. Uh, the import of that is within a single site, you're talking about three copies minimally. And so uh, you might ask, well, you know, why not just use sort of like a, a classic parity scheme, like a you know array or flavor or something to that effect? And, and the answer is typically that the object storage deployment tends to be very heavily capacity optimized, biggest, fattest, slowest spinning disks possible, rebuild times in the hundreds of hours, hundred plus hours for four terabyte drives, and we're moving into the five and six terabyte range, so uh, onerous. And, and frankly, the impact uh, impact is that you are uh, running uh, without, uh, without you know, the level of protection you need, 
during that sort of, you're exposed during that rebuild period. So that's why you don't use something like a traditional parity scheme. Now I discussed that, that our E-series system, which is predominantly a um, you know, very well engineered system with you know, traditional RAS considerations, high, very dense, optimized for a very high throughput system, but it doesn't necessarily have a lot of the higher order uh, storage data management capabilities within it, and that's you know, kind of a design um, decision. You know, let's ha it's designed to work really well with various stacks that have that intelligence, and so this is a first class sort of underpinning to those. And I would argue Swift's actually an excellent example of this. But one interesting characteristic above what I just described is this dynamic disk pool. So it's another implementation of the academic work behind the crush algorithm, for those who might be familiar. Um, and the, it's, it amounts to more of a deconstructed or a distributed array, virtually you know, node level ratio coding, however you prefer to refer to it. The effect of it, though, is that rebuild times and the working rule of thumb you know, within our you know, development arm there is that it's approximately 5% of the time it would take to do a rebuild. And so what does that mean? Well, now you can use a classic sort of, or, or at least obtain the effects of a classic sort of uh, parity scheme. And so, you know, in terms of like numbers, that 3x for a single copy, hey, I need to store a terabyte object or a number of objects that amount to a terabyte, three terabytes of capacity assigned to the protection of it, all of the environmental, all of the environmentals, the cost and, you know, paint power pipe and whatnot. <clears throat> Uh, it's, it's not uh, insignificant. Well, I can reduce that to, it's actually like 1.28x, but you know, approximately 1.3x of, uh, of, uh, of you know, the original thing that I wanted to store. So you know, uh, that's a pretty dramatic difference. To be clear, um, you almost certainly, uh, use case dependent, but very commonly will want to architect for uh, site resiliency. You'll need another copy somewhere else. And so yes, that's another 1.3x at the other destination, but Swift by default 3x on one site and usually 2x at the second site because you wouldn't want to reconstitute across the LAN. And so you know, basically there's a replication activity that occurs amongst those copies. So the other effect of this is that we, we remove that repli a significant inhibitor to the ultimate scale that Swift can achieve by by tuning down or basically throttling down that replication traffic. After all, we're not making the additional copies we're not making the additional copies within the single site. You do make that second copy for the, for the additional site. And we've seen Swift deployments fold under the pressure of ongoing, ongoing replication. It's quite an interesting thing to see like, you know, secondhand uh, commodity disks, um, you know, no name x86 compute uh, assembled to use Swift with 40 gig Ethernet interconnects. And now that's exotic, I've only seen that once, but that's where you do end up putting a lot of your costs into it from a hardware perspective. And so we reduce that dramatically, um, you, and you can achieve, achieve a greater scale. The other effect is that consistent hashing ring is a eventually consistent model, whereas in this scheme within a single site, we're immediately consistent. You get that right acknowledgement, you're protected. So that's a reference architecture that debuted just after the uh, summit in Hong Kong, and it's part of our NetApp OpenSec Deployment and Operations Guide. Um, there's a I guess I can't reference them explicitly, but there's a large university somewhere south of the equator <laughs> that is uh, deploying this at scale now. So uh, pretty interesting capability, we think. So block storage, this is where we started and I think where we put probably the most overall effort in to date. So you know, for those that aren't familiar, and you know, I'm imagining some of the, the audience here is intimately familiar, uh, Cinder is not the, con the data plane it is a provisioning control plane. It's the orchestration activity. Uh, you know, there's no impedance to the actual data flow. Uh, so just kind of set the table with that. Um, there's a number of different options that we avail. With our clustered on tap system that we just, I kind of described a little bit, at least at a very top level, uh, we support multiple connection methods. And it may be at first a little mystifying why I would even talk about NFS in the context of a, a block storage service, but get to that in a second. Um, but uh, we support parallelized NFS, NFS, and iSCSI at present. Uh, with seven mode, which is kind of our classic mode of operation, has a lot of the characteristics of ONTAP I talked about, but not the scale out characteristics per se. Um, we, uh, we do have that available. Uh, to be clear, we spend the vast majority of our time, uh, frankly, seven mode is sort of a maintenance mode. 
Uh, we spent all of our sort of development around innovation on clustered on tap and e-series. Uh, those are our platforms for the future. That's, that's, uh, and it's frankly a better architectural mesh in both cases than seven mode is. Uh, that said, it is supported and we have a lot of production deployment on seven mode, so it is out there. Um, on E-Series, that debut is an ICE house. That's a brand new thing. So iSCSI presently, and we'll look to expand upon the, uh, the array of options there. I guess array of options, no pun intended. Or maybe it is intended. So um, just a little bit about clustered on tap. So there's different ways you can kind of define uh, atomicity of the tenant. There's different things. We talked about the, the SVM, the storage vir virtual machine, that kind of virtualized storage controller. There's flex balls within it, which are a, a container that can contract and grow or you know, and expand. Uh, and then within it are, at least in our interpretation of, of Cinder, uh, we create Cinder volumes. So in the case of NFS, just to you know, fast forward to that, what we basically do is we mount NFS to the location of the hypervisor and by virtue of the hypervisor and libvirt, we essentially virtualize the file into a block storage device. So a virtualized you know, block, block, block device. Um, and that's a commonly employed uh, uh, scheme, by the way, in enterprise virtualization. It's vastly more scalable than, frankly, iSCSI. Any given iSCSI system is gonna run out of LUNs and initiators well in advance of what you could conceivably contain within a, a given NFS export. And I should also mention that NFS, this is not your, so to speak, father's NFS, the thing you might have known about 10 or 15 years. When you take, about, take something like Custard on tap, where you can have multiple nodes uh, actually supplying I.O., think about it, I guess you could say data or uh, I.O. engines, if you will, uh, supplying capability into a single global namespace, and then you take the capabilities of parallelized NFS, which it can you know, kind of create a little bit more of a distributed I.O. characteristic against that, you don't have that sort of classic fan-in problem and availability problems associated with it. So the point is, is we can get vastly more scalable. OpenStack built to this sort of hyperscale design center. It made perfect sense for us to, uh, uh, to, to you know, kind of go there with NFS. That said, and you see this probably increasingly even this week in the ironic sessions, there are a variety of use cases where the consumption of Cinder would be from non-vert or bare metal. Maybe even, you know, if you will, entities that are external to that which is managed by OpenStack. We have a number of um, deployments. In fact, I believe we're, we have them on stage in our third session here today, uh, well, at least one of those customers, uh, PayPal, uh, that, uh, that uses Cinder independently, or actually it may be the eBay portion, not PayPal, of that, uh, of that consortia, that, uh, or, or that, that group, um, that use Cinder independently in places of the rest of OpenStack. So in that scenario, what, what you need to be able to supply when you're asking for a block device is something that you know, uh, you know, has the semantics of an iSCSI, something that like, I can do something with. I asked for a block device, well, give me something I can mount. iSCSI is the clear option in that scenario. So we support both, and it's kind of a per use case type of, type of decision. Um, another sort of subtlety is that, again, uh, mindful of that kind of hyperscale sort of ambition of OpenStack, uh, we don't actually use by default flexible snapshots because we don't want to commingle tenants in a snapshot. You know, from a security perspective, that would not be optimal. Maybe if you're talking about DR of the whole cloud, sure. Uh, but in a in a scenario where uh, you have you know Coke and Pepsi um, in in the uh, you know, uh, deriving benefit of a single open source or open stack public cloud, uh, you don't want to lock them collectively in a single snapshot. So we actually do per file or LUN, in the case of iSCSI, uh, cloning. And of course, in the case of a snapshot, we mark that as immutable. A clone, of course, is a writable version thereof. So just a little bit about what we've done there. You know, I, I, I talked about it earlier. Um, you know, avail our core competencies, our basic value propositions to the market, the things that make us different from a commodity block device. How do we actually do that? And it basically starts with something that we've participated quite a bit in within the community is evolving this notion of a cinder volume type. And by the way, uh, in a subsequent, you know, set of slides, I'll talk about a, a shared file system as a service capability that will also have this kind of type construct. And, and what we end up doing is allow the administrator or the cloud deployer to define, and it's, highly, it's entirely arbitrary, uh, 
uh, a catalog of capabilities. So, uh, and you compose those individual catalog items with the characteristics of the back end. So we, what we do is we take things, for example, like deduplication and compression, and we advertise those as explicitly capabilities of a clustered on tap back end. And we allow the deployer, you know, the cloud administrator, if you will, to say, um, you know, I, I, I want to create a, a volume of a particular type that makes sense for my user base, for my tenant base, and, uh, and it will amount to, you know, I'll call it gold or cats, dogs, or birds, or whatever, um, but it'll be composed of those types of capabilities. The Cinder scheduler, when it receives a request for a particular new uh, volume, and it has the type parameter appended, it will you know, evaluate all of the backends available to it and place that provisioning request appropriately. Um, so you get the effect of, and by the way, I should mention, you can compose these things as you know, kind of abstract and coalesced set of capabilities. Maybe like platinum means like automatically replicated to a, a certain locale. Uh, maybe it means that uh, you know, it's in a certain media type uh, whereas maybe, you know, tin or something like that would be on, you know, cheap disk and, and uh, it, you know, maybe it doesn't have ISLAs associated with it. But you can also be, you know, very specific, like you could create a type called deduplication. You could also have in types, a, a, you can specify that it ought to go to a back end of a particular type. The point is there's immense flexibility to build the catalog the way you want it to. And so that's the way we take things that are different about our systems and make them explicitly accessible to the tenant and you can derive that value. Uh, you know, maybe it's measures of storage efficiency wherein um, because of aggressive compression and deduplication or thin provisioning, uh, you, you know, a tenant basically gets the ter 10 terabytes they ask logically, but in reality you're consuming you know, a small fraction thereof. And that actually could be the means by which you know, a given service is profitable. Yes, sir. Uh, no, um, not exactly. So storage grid has um, a variety of capabilities that are kind of outside of the scope we're talking about here because we haven't really formally launched it with some of, like I said, the API support we're talking about. Swift itself, the stuff I talked about, is a reference architecture that basically changes the ring builder, or supplies different parameters to the ring builder logic. Basically says don't make the extra copies because you can inherently trust this. We don't do any other modification in Swift at this time. So yeah, that doesn't exist. <clears throat> so just a little bit about this kind of volume, I'm sorry, a cinder volume type and, and some of the other QoS capabilities associated. Here you can see we've established a gold, silver, and bronze. We've assigned certain attributes to it. Um, you know, in this particular case, we also has established QoS policies, um, you know, basically ceilings, if you will, per volume. Uh, <clears throat> And you'll show there you can actually uh, create a volume and select from the type uh, that, uh, that uh, makes sense and, uh, you know, magic ensues, right? <laughs> Any questions around this? Okay. So I'll just move past that. So a new thing in IceHouse that I talked about are E-series and our EF-series, which again is an all-flash variety of E-series. Um, is uh, now accessible via Cinder. So that is uh, uh, in IceHouse, but we also did perform a backport, uh, which is available on NetApp's Net Net GitHub repos to support the use of it uh, under Havana and Grizzly as well. So those didn't go into upstream or in the stable branch for those because, of course, the criteria for that is bug fixes only. That represents a new feature, but it is accessible. It is in the open, albeit on the NetApp GitHub repos. There's a scenario where you might imagine, I want like to derive the value of the very high throughput capabilities of an E-series system. And uh, you know, perhaps I've created a cinder volume type of analytics. And so maybe I've got Sahara, you know, analytics as a service deployed on top of it. And it selects from a, a cinder backend that can support uh, the throughput characteristics you need of it. And you know, here's another depiction with cluster on tap systems. In this scenario, Silver was composed such that it had a replication policy associated. In this case, actually, we're depicting a boot from volume scenario, which I'll get into a little bit more detail here in just a second. Okay, so this next thing I'm gonna talk about really bridges Glance 
OpenStack Compute, and Cinder. So it, it's the ability to actually create new instances based on our cloning technology, essentially instantaneously. So just a little bit about the day in the life of a VM by default in OpenStack, a guest virtual machine, an instance in OpenStack parlance. So the basics of it are that uh, you know, a tenant of an OpenStack cloud says, you know, give me an instance of a particular flavor. Give me a guest virtual machine of a particular flavor. And Nova, and again, sort of a simplification here, uh, you know, interrogates its, its fleet of hypervisors and tries to make the, it plays the Tetris game, if you will, and trying to place it appropriately. Um, <clears throat> uh, it, what ends up happening, of course, in, is selecting the flavor, which has, you know, different characteristics of, you know, memory and compute characteristics. You're also, so, of course, selecting an image to boot from. So, uh, you know, perhaps CentOS, perhaps Ubuntu, you know, Suros, maybe if you enjoy pain. Uh, very, various different um, uh, options, of course. Um, you know, every option under the sun in the way of images. Um, what ends up happening, though, is in interrogating that fleet, it's going to determine, um, you know, hey, okay, where's the best place to put it per flavor? Okay, well, now I need to actually get those OS bits, that image, if you will, over to the location of the hypervisor such that it actually instantiate it, it can actually boot it. And so if it doesn't exist in the form of some, I guess you could say a cache copy on that system, it will curl it. It's an HTTP copy over to that location. You do get the benefit of subsequent image or subsequent boot instances created of that same image. You get a kind of a caching effect within the hypervisor, but it is local to the hypervisor. And so what we end up doing um, here is a scenario where maybe you have Glance on NetApp. And if you do have Glance co-located with your Cinder capacity store, what you can do is you can boot from volume by default. And so there's a couple of things that you get from this. One is when booting from the volume, you're, you're starting with a persistent in instance. Now, it may be that your use case doesn't demand a persistent instance. You can still actually just select delete upon terminate and get the effect of an ephemeral instance, uh, again, if the use case doesn't demand persistence. But I would, I would argue or assert that you know, it's far easier to go from uh, persistent to ephemeral than it is the other way around. You're, you're into having to copy out the things you care about into some source of persistence if you said, suddenly realize, actually, I did need to keep that around. So uh, it makes some sense to actually start with booting uh, instances in a persistent manner first. But OK, back to like this model. So, so if it's the case you have Glance, perhaps located in NFS, um, uh, and you have, or, or vended via NFS, and you also have the capacity store for Cinder on the same NetApp flexible volume, we will clone from Glance to Cinder, and the storage copy portion, or the image copy portion of it, of the boot process is essentially instantaneous, because we're, again, we're playing pointer tricks. It's not a scenario where any bits are copied until there's, there's no, no like additional capacity overhead until there's a net new write or overwrite. So it is effectively instant. Uh, of course, you still have to boot the actual instance itself. So I'm not trying to claim it's entirely instant, but the storage portion of it, it's mitigated. The copy portion of it's mitigated. Uh, if it's the case that Glance is not on NetApp, um, or perhaps is elsewhere on a system, external, you know, another NetApp system somewhere, we'll make that first copy. We'll, we'll make it <clears throat> and we'll create it as a, as a cache. Excuse me. <clears throat> I'll take a drink here. We'll, we'll make that first copy, and once we've done that, then that it, it is cached, but it, that cache is global to your entire fleet of hypervisors. It's not localized to that one compute node. Another benefit to this approach is you can actually boot your compute node stateless. We have a number of folks actually do this. Okay, well, in booting from this sort of shared storage uh, persistent model, I also easily facilitate live migration, which of course shared storage underpinnings are uh, generally a requirement for live migration scenarios. So there are any number of different aspects why this is interesting. Sometimes we call this a rapid cloning capability. And that effect is you get persistent images or instances that are storage efficient and appear much, much faster. There's an additional optimization that went into IceHouse, wherein if you have Glance on a flex volume on this end of a cluster and you have Cinder on a flex volume on this end of the cluster, we have an additional layer of optimization that does a copy offload that's inbound between those nodes, doesn't get washed through the host, and so uh, you know, just an additional enhancement to, enhancement to this model. So shared file systems. 
Um, and I guess the thing to start with is if you believe IDC numbers, and even if they're not entirely accurate, they're directionally correct, uh, something like 65% of all sh commercial storage sold was, was, uh, was delivered to underpin shared file system deployment in some form. And uh, you know, even if you say, well, no, I argue with that, and it's 40%. It's an immense component of, of, of infrastructure. And if you accept that OpenStack is the de facto open infrastructure as a service capability, and we do, and that, then there's a critical omission. You know, how can I render you know, infrastructure primitives like shared file system in an as a service model? And so what we've basically done, and I should point out that we'll go into significant more depth on this topic in the ensuing hour. I think it's actually 10, uh, 10, 10, 10 15, sorry. Um, if you know what Cinder is, then you know what Manila is. Manila is Cinder for shared file systems. And it actually goes a little further than that. It frankly originally is a fork of Cinder. But there's a lot of additional, lift, you know, frankly, heavy lifting associated with delivering shared file systems, uh, orchestrating and coordinating the activity so that you have a, you know, things mapped in the correct same uh, auth and user namespace, uh, you know, plumbing into the tenant specific SDN, uh, solving kind of a last variation, a last mile problem. So, hey, I've vended it to you, now do something with it. Those are all things that Manila has to contend with that Cinder does not. And so Manila is a new project. And I, don't, I should probably be careful with it. Um, it's accelerated dramatically in the last few months. It's not entirely new. We've been at this for a while. So NetApp, you know, basically conceived, designed, initially implemented in collaboration with a, with a number of other companies and increasingly are building community around this. Uh, you'll see us next hour on stage with what you probably would identify as a number of NetApp's traditional competitors in the market. Uh, and the intention there is you know, to build the community and legitimize Manila so that it becomes, you know, over time, it moves towards a core status. You know, the community is not going to accept a NetApp only thing foisted upon it. And of course, our interests are we have a lot of cool capabilities when it comes to shared file systems and we'd like to see that represented as an option uh, uh, you know, along with a uh, co-equal option with block and object. And certainly that's very applicable when you talk about like movement of classic or POSIX style applications into an as a service model with OpenStack. So, you know, a scenario, give me a shared access between instances X and Y to a, a, a existing perhaps if share or create a net new NFS export um, that, uh, you know, I can coordinate between them. So, you know, hey, Manila is a new thing. Uh, it's on StackForge, meaning, uh, well, actually, here's a little bit of a demo, I, I guess, as we're getting into this. It is a real thing. So this is, a, a, this is not all smoke and mirrors. This is, no, granted, recorded, but nevertheless, you know, Horizon interface does exist for it. Uh, it's not in upstream. It's not in Ice House, and it's not yet upstream in Juno proper. It all exists with on StackForge. You know, here's a scenario where we're creating shares. You'll see us actually map it to, uh, you know, particular IP entities, and there's a number of policies that you can apply to it from a security perspective. Uh, much, much more on this particular topic in the next hour. So I'll maybe defer questions on that. If you do want to become involved in the community, and we do definitely actively uh, encourage that, you know, we follow all the conventions of the OpenStack community and all the other projects and programs, IRC, weekly IRC meetings, uh, you know, it is, the code is on StackForge. It's built in a manner such that, you know, uh, we've automated testing, you know, it is, uh, uh, you know, gated through the same mechanisms that other code submissions uh, to other OpenStack projects are. So the very clear intention here is to get this into an officially incubated status and then into core. Now, I should state that independently of that, um, we are working with distribution providers to deliver this in the form of a tech preview. Um, you know, so think of them as somewhat orthogonal efforts. We want to deliver the value of this uh, as quickly as we po possibly can. And it is usable in a limited set of use cases today. Um, we expect those use cases and, you know, some of the, you know, accounting for various permutations to expand rapidly here in the coming months. I should also mention that the gentleman sitting here in the front, Ben Schwarzlander, is uh, presently the PTL on, uh, on Manila. So that's shared file systems. Uh, we've done a number of things. I talked about E-series, any of series. I talked about how we're moving through the progress of Manila. Uh, Paralyzed NFS is something we default to. 
uh, in our sender drivers. So of course we evaluate whether the compute node, the host OS on it can support it and then we negotiate to whatever uh, version of NFS is appropriate for it. But if available, I'll just, as an example, I think uh, contemporary RHEL uh, does support Parallelized NFS, then we'll, we'll make use of it. Uh, in some ways, you almost want to call Parallelized NFS something other than that because it connotes that it's NFS. Certainly it is, but there's enough different about it, it you know, that it, you almost want to depart from the kind of the legacy connotation of NFS. Uh, talked about the in, additional optimization for enhanced instance creation. There's a number of reference architectures that we've been actively engaging on, and you'll see a lot more from us in the, in the not distant future. One of the sort of, um, I guess you could say tenants of how we approach reference architectures is that we want to provide a company automation. So it's definitely useful and interesting, a nice you know, read through like sort of the philosophy and thought process behind deploying OpenStack with NetApp. Um, but boy, wouldn't it be a lot easier if I could just make it so with commonly you know, used configuration management tools a la a puppet and the future chef. So that's, that's what some of the stuff we're working on. These are just sort of focus areas, things that we want to work on and that we are in the process of uh, planning on uh, attacking in the Juno timeframe. So we're happy to discuss some of, more of that individually. I guess we can do a little bit during the Q&A, but since these don't yet exist, this is just an indication of some of our priorities, an expansion in particular into heat and solometer and some work in Horizon in, in mind. Uh, a, a big thing, though, as I was talking about deploying reference architecture. So we can definitely deploy Cinder in an optimal way for, uh, uh, and some of this, by the way, has existed in the community for a while independently of NetApp, in a way that, um, uh, you know, if, I'm a, if I have a Puppet uh, consumption, or if I, if I use Puppet, or if I use Chef, it's already the case that you can actually, like, configure Cinder, in some cases, you know, in a highly available way, um, uh, and I can, uh, you know, plug the right values into Cinder Comp and that type of thing. But what I'm referring to here is more. It's actually addressing the controllers, the storage devices themselves, uh, such that you can actually configure their state and their, their, their uh, uh, I guess, configuration explicitly to be a puppet and chef. So we're working with both of these uh, companies collaboratively uh, to deliver modules and enablement for those platforms. There is some in the way of uh, capability, some capability on Puppet Forge today for seven mode. So we're actually gonna deliver the sh uh, um, uh, clustered on tap and E-series for, for Puppet and then Chef probably just from a progression perspective but not priority will fall a little bit thereafter. You know, there's a lot of different reasons why we think this makes sense and, and this is somewhat informed by like the use cases we've seen in using OpenStack with NetApp. Um, you know, a, a good way to start a proof of concept is to take one of those SVMs I just talked about, whether it's a V filer, which is the old name in seven mode, a storage virtual machine in, in clustered on tap, and just carve it out and deploy it to your OpenStack proof of concept. So it's a way to get started very quickly. You know, it's, it's very much the case that, you know, deploying your kind of high value applications, both, and I, I'm not the world's biggest fan of the, this metaphor, I'd argue somewhat tortured metaphor of pets and, and cattle, but you know, deploy your pets and your cattle in the same infrastructure, it may very well be that that quote unquote livestock entity becomes the crown jewels over time and you have a seamless infrastructure that you can attach those higher SLAs and actually support it. Uh, there's definitely a measure of, uh, of you know, frankly holistic consideration of the effect of your cloud deployment. If I'm storing data three and five and in the very extreme, I've actually heard 11 times all over for protection against various scenarios, um, what does that mean for your power bill, your sustainability? It's not just the cost of CapEx for the individual system, but like, what does it take to make this a sustainable business? You know, do I have the most efficient mechanisms in place to support high SLAs? Do I have the flexibility to support an array of capabilities? Uh, and I, we believe we offer those, and we hope to expand upon those in the future. Um, some of the things that we've been working on, again, flavor of reference architectures is the notion of assembling what we call FlexPod, so basically Cisco, UCS, and Nexus with NetApp FAS systems, uh, I guess in the future E-series systems, such that um, you have a converged infrastructure. Think of it as cloud in a box now. It's maybe not that simple. The point, though, is there's a little bit of an easy button in consumption and deployment. So we have like uh, some preview reference architecture on that, and then we have separately a, just a simple RHEL OSP and uh, OpenStack, RHEL OSP, so Red Hat's distribution and NetApp uh, reference architecture that exists um, independently of those Cisco components. 
debuted last, last month, all accessible off of netapp.com slash OpenStack. We are also working with other distributions and reference architectures. So we see like different you know, mappings per vertical and use case. Um, a great way to kind of keep track of us is netapp.com slash OpenStack redirects to a community site. You can ask questions there directly. For those in the development community, uh, you can find us hanging out on IRC, uh, Twitter. I'm trying to enforce Twitter discipline, uh, not necessarily natural to it. Um, and a variety of different capabilities. Probably the one sort of canonical document on what we've done and how to use us is the NetApp OpenStack Deployment and Operations Guide posted on app.com slash OpenStack. And that document is presently Havana, but in the next, um, uh, we believe five to seven business days, you'll see the Ice House uh, uh, version posted there. So there's a variety of sessions, some of which have already occurred, to be clear, uh, that we think you ought to, be know about, ought to know about that are related. Um, certainly today, immediately there after this, is a Manila session. Again, this is not a NetApp-specific thing. It's a community session. And following that, we're going to get into a little bit of best practices, kind of a minor user case study with both NetApp internal engineering IT, where we have a vast fleet of, uh, of systems uh, in within a single site. I heard a number of 100,000 instances that we are moving to OpenStack over time. So that some of that's already underway, and you'll hear from them. Also, PayPal's on stage to discuss their use of OpenStack on NetApp. Uh, there's some other sessions, like for example, Red Hat's extending Triple O. They show like the deployment of OpenStack systems through Ironic. Uh, Nebula is showing OpenStack integration in their booth, for example. Also, in the back, as you folks are leaving, we have a, a survey uh, for feedback. If you have a minute, we'll see you in Paris. Looking forward to it. Um, first uh, summit in EMEA. And then I think that leaves about 10 minutes, if I'm not mistaken, for Q&A. And uh, so we'll go back to this. Any, uh, any questions? Is that a bit dense for this time of day? <laughs> Collectively, no comment. Got it. All right. Anything? Uh, we'll be in the back afterwards. And if there's anything that uh, you want to get into more depth on, uh, well, maybe not appropriate for this context. We'll be around to answer questions. I do appreciate your attendance. Thank you.